All right, then moving on, we're in part two on Corruptions of Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to creationliberty.com, type in the word witness, W-I-T-N-E-S-S, -S, and that will get you to that article that is also entitled Corruptions of Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses. Or if you're listening by YouTube, there will be a link in the description. You can click that to take you, well, take you to the article, but you have to scroll down to get roughly to where we are. And I encourage people still, if they want to contact us, they want to talk with other Christians, they want to find out more details about the video, why is it that we don't have comments on, on the YouTube videos and things like that, go to the description and read. All that information is on there on almost every single video we've got. So uh, if you don't understand those things, go there and read that. It'll explain more. So last week we had ended talking about Charles Russell and his pyramidology, okay, and how there are, well, at least the Jehovah's Witnesses, or at least the, I'll say the Watchtower Society, let's say that, has taken great pains to make sure that they remove certain sections that were stated by Charles Russell, because obviously he's a false prophet, and they don't want the people to know that he was a false prophet, because obviously if your religious concept, right, whatever it is that your religious organization was founded by someone who's been proven to be a false prophet, then people are not going to join your cult. I mean, that's just logical, right? So you have to cover these things up and keep people from reading this kind of stuff so they would know. And so we were talking about some of the cover-ups that they've been doing. And then, of course, they also cover up the fact that Russell was a pyramidist. He studied pyramidology, which is basically coming up with a bunch of his own personal theories about the Great Pyramid of Giza and then making all these predictions based on that. Those predictions did not come true. He's a false prophet. So now let's get back to the timeline, okay? So right now, uh, based on where we left off last week, in 1896, okay, what, Zion's Watchtower and Track Society, which is what it was, remember, after he split off from Nelson Barber, because I'm, I'm just trying to recap so we can refresh our memories from last week. After he split off from Nelson Barber, Zion's Watchtower and Tract Society was renamed Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So that's getting pretty close to what it is today. Because that's later going to be shortened. Just for short, it'll, it's called the Watchtower. By 1906, Russell went through the transformation that every cult leader seems to go through. He told his readers that he was the word of God on earth for men. Okay, here's what he said, and this was a, uh, he was quoted by one of his followers, this is a book called Church History, is by one of his followers back in, I think it was, yeah, it was 1908, that's where I have it on there. But Charles Russell was quoted saying, quote, No, the truths I present as God's mouthpiece were not revealed in visions or dreams, nor by the God's audible voice, nor at all at once, but gradually, especially since 1870 and particularly since 1880. Now, of course, what he's referring to is all the false doctrine and the false prophecies that he learned and merged into his own personal beliefs about things. He continues and says, Neither is this clear unfolding of truth due to any human ingenuity or acuteness of perception which, by the way, is wrong, because he was practicing pyramidism. So it was by human ingenuity. He says, but to the simple fact that God's due time has come, and if I did not speak, and no other agent could be found, the very stones would cry out, end quote. Of course, he's referring, referring to Luke chapter 19, verse 40, it says, and he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, this was in context to Christ's disciples preaching the truth of his presence in Israel to the Jews. This was not used in the context of cultists who practiced pyramidology. Okay. So when 1914 came, obviously big anticipation from a lot of the Russellites at that time, who, by the way, and I'll mention this later, at the time they were called the Bible students. That's what they were typically known as. So the so-called, I'll put in quotations, Bible students were anticipating this year, right? Because that was, that was the end of the world that he predicted. Now, some Jehovah's Witnesses today believe that Russell never said these things. Because again, their cultic elders hide the truth from them. The Watchtower Society itself hides the truth from the elders on top of that, so many of them are ignorant as well. 
But in his book, Russell stated very clearly and, and the following, what I'm going to read to you, and these are the, this is the preface to these predictions that he was making. He said, in Studies in the Scriptures, quote, In this chapter, we present the Bible evidence proving that the full end of the times of the Gentiles, i.e., which means that is, that's Latin, it just means that is, the full end of their lease of dominion will be reached. Okay, now before I, hold on, before I even begin continue on that, what he's saying here, he says the full end of the times of the Gentiles. That means that all government rule of the Gentiles would end. That's what he's talking about here. That means nobody in, there's, it's basically it's going to be God's kingdom take over and all the governments are going to end. That's what he's claiming. He says the full end of their lease of dominion will be reached in A.D. 1914 and that that date will be the farthest limit of the rule of imperfect men, end quote. Well, what happened? Because it still seems like this world is under the rule of imperfect men. Because that was supposed to be the downfall of all, all governments. So during 1914, Russell, the Russellite movement really picked up momentum. Because, now Russell, it's not like he knew this ahead of time. He didn't know that that year was going to be the start of World War I. So you can see how his movement, they're saying, oh, the end times is here. It's going to be the fall of all governments. Many farmers at that time, the same as 1844. Now, if you remember the great disappointment of 1844, there were many farmers at that time. They refused to plant crops in the spring because they believed the end of the world was imminent. As the world enter, entered into war, it gave it this temporary illusion of Armageddon to faithful cultists. But when the year rolled over to 1915, it was as if the great disappointment of 1844 was now the great disappointment of 1914. The only difference is you have 70 years between them. So Russell tried to keep his cult followers from leaving by pushing the date back one year to 1915. Now remember when I told you to remember the names of William Miller and Nelson Barber, that's because William Miller did the exact same thing. He pushed his date back from what it was, and Nelson Barber did the same thing. He pushed his back to the following year as well. All of them failed. And as we already know, I mean, based from, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out, but 1915 came, and 1915 went, and nothing happened. Sadly, without repentance in his heart, Russell was finally judged by God for his sinful offenses and died during a train ride home the following year on October 31st, 1916, at age 64. And he ended up in hell in the lake of fire without Christ. I mean, if people think that false prophets will not have their part in the lake of fire, you've got to be kidding me. There's only one way to be saved from that, and that is to come to grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing. That's what pen repentance means, grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing. The Bible defines that very clearly. And again, I encourage people to go to creationliberty.com, type in the word repent, R-E-P-E-N-T. There's an article and an audio teaching to go along with that. It's called, Is Repentance Part of Salvation? We were just reading in our first half through the book of Acts that the, the Christians in the early church acknowledged that God, it said, gave the Gentiles repentance unto life. Repentance unto life. What is that supposed to mean? Why didn't it say belief unto life? Well, don't misunderstand. Belief is part of it. It's repentance and faith. Because repentance is what brings that heart. It gets, there's a condition of the heart that is ready to put the faith into Christ on his blood to pay, be paid on their account. So without that repentance, people cannot be born again. And that's why there are so many false converts in this world. So anyway, getting back to this overview, Russell had left instructions after he died that his position was to be replaced by somebody else. But the authority over the corporate watchtower and Bible tract society was to be shared with a board of directors. So there was supposed to be a main head honcho, which is going to be the CEO, and then a board of directors, right? 
along with the editorial committee, blah, 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 all these people. So Russell's vice president, his name was Joseph Rutherford, a judge, a lawyer, and he was Russell's legal advisor. He found a loophole in the contracts which allowed him to legally supersede the board of directors without a vote, and, he, and so he took over the company by force. Now, obviously, this is going to create blowback, right, from the board members. Not, not from the Jehovah's Witnesses in general, but from, or excuse me, at the time it would have been the Russellites. But the board members in, in general were not going to like this. Nobody's going to be one for, want to be forced out of their own controlling interest of the company. Of course, they would have shared it, and it would have been everything would have been just fine if either Rutherford had been an honest man, meaning that he said, you know what, guys, there's this loophole here, but let's get into the contracts and fix that so nothing bad happens later. He could have done that, but he wasn't an honest man. Or if there wasn't a loophole in the contracts in the first place, which raises a curious question. If Rutherford was Russell's legal advisor... Could it have been that Rutherford was the one who created the loophole in the first place with this plan in mind? Hmm. Well, he was a judge, and he was his lawyer, and all these contracts were signed with Joseph Rutherford helping him out with them. I don't know. Food for thought, though. So to settle this matter, Rutherford called a meeting of the board, and this is what he told his subordinate in private beforehand. And this is from a book called Faith on the March, which was written by a man named A.H. McMillan. Now, McMillan was a faithful follower of the Watchtower. So don't misunderstand thinking this is somebody who's like some third party. He was part of the Watchtower. And he served under Russell and Rutherford faithfully until his death in 1966. He was baptized into Russell's cult in 1900. So I just want to make sure we preface who's, who's documenting all this information. Rutherford said, quote, if they get too obstreperous, which that, that word means if, if they get noisy and difficult to control, he says, and indicate they want to start action against the society, call a policeman. If it becomes necessary, don't hesitate, end quote. So the meeting was held, and needless to say, the board was not happy. The argument started to get heated, but since Rutherford's scheme gave him complete control, Guess who owned the building? Rutherford. <laughs> Obviously, Joseph Rutherford owned the building since he was taking complete control without a vote. And what he did is he, I mean, if it doesn't require a vote, then he could say, uh, the company's mine, I win, thanks for coming. And that's, that's it. There's nothing anybody else can do. So he wanted to really make this a public matter because, okay, if the police have to come in and arrest these irate men and escort them off the property, then that's going to look really good in a Watchtower report to faithful readers, isn't it? Oh, Judge Rutherford was oppressed by these, these horrible, angry men, and they had to be escorted out by the police. But thank God that Joseph Rutherford is there to keep things in order. That's exactly what the plan was. It's a cult like any other. So a police officer removed the men from the building, and Rutherford took complete control over the Watchtower and Bible Tract Society. However, this was going to start backfiring. This is, it's a double-edged sword here, because at the time, remember, 1914 was the beginning of World War I, and the U.S. Department of Justice, very soon after this, they put out a warrant for the arrest of Rutherford and seven other Watchtower directors under the 1917 Espionage Act which was a new act that prohibited specifically any interference with military recruitment or operations during active wartime. Now, I, we have a few military and ex-military members in our church, and so they're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. The, the Watchtower's cultic teaching encouraged members to refuse the draft, because after all, they're pacifists. I'll explain that more in a minute. They're convincing their members, if any of them are active military, to break their oaths and leave their duty of service, which is unbiblical, by the way, because you're, the Bible tells us to keep our word. 
And if we take an oath to keep it, even though we shouldn't be swearing oaths in, in the first place, as Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. He says, whatever comes more of these is of evil. But if you do swear these oaths and do these things, then fulfill them. Else God will find you to be a liar. And if for, there's for some reason, like for example, if somebody was a part of a, a wicked cult, like, you know, take your pick, Freemasons or something like that, right? And they swore oaths in those and they didn't understand what they were saying at the time or whatever, or even if they did understand what they're saying and they lied and they had to get out of it, then what you do is you come to the Lord God in repentance. There's a whole lot of people, and this is one of the things that's irritating to me, is that there's I've seen a lot of different Christian, or even in some instances so-called so -called Christian, in quotations, teachers out there that are teaching people, well, you know, when you took those O's in Freemasonry, uh, you, you didn't know what you were saying, just come out of it, it's okay. Wait a second, it's not okay. You lied. See, they don't teach any repentance. It's like they don't even understand the concept. And I think there's a whole lot of false converts that go, that basically jump out of the frying pan and into the fire. Because they're not being taught that repentance unto life, which we were just talking about from, I believe that was in Acts chapter 11, if you want to go look that up. Anyway, so they're, they're convincing them to any act of military to break their oaths, leave their duty of service, since joining the military, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, even to this day, is a what they call a, quote, fellowshipping offense, end quote. You can be disfellowshipped for that. And disfellowshipped, I mean, they hold, like I said before, they hold the term disfellowshipped. That is worse than blasphemy to them. You don't dare get disfellowshipped in the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, first of all, now I, I want to make mention, I do have an image on the website. You can click on it, and you can see it's, it's just in case there's a Jehovah's Witness that wants to argue with you, Joseph Rutherford, he was never arrested. I have his arrest papers on there. I have a image scan of his arrest papers with his fingerprints and everything on there. It's public record. Now, first of all, I want to say this. I am not arguing that being arrested automatically means that Joseph Rutherford did something wrong. Or in, to explain this in other words, it, I'm not approaching this from a fallacious standpoint because even Christ's disciples, many of them were innocent, but they were arrested and thrown in jail anyway. They didn't do anything wrong. However, in this particular instance, when Rutherford and the rest of his cult society are defying the government on unbiblical grounds, which what they're doing is they're hindering the military, which there is no biblical precedent for such a thing under these specific circumstances. But they held fast to these rules because they believed it was the end of days at the time. They're, they're simply, at this point, by, because they held on to these beliefs despite the conflict with government institutions of the military, then they're just a bunch of rebels who are faithful to deceptive teachings. And so the government did warrant, warrant their arrest, and those warrants were justified. In this particular case. So I don't want people to misunderstand it. I'm not saying he's bad because he was arrested. I'm saying he was bad and arrested because he was defying something that there was no biblical precedent to defy. Now at this point, before I continue on with the timeline, I need to take go off to a little slight rabbit trail here and talk about the United Nations and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because there's a really, at this point, we, we've been talking about pacifism, right? And pacifists what they are, they believe that all war, all violence, any of that is unjustifiable. Which is not true. If it was unjustifiable, then why did God have the Jews, the nation of Israel, go to war with certain societies in which he told them to kill every man, woman, child, and beast in that society? Because they were so wicked and so disgusting and filthy with their sin, there was no good that could come out of it anymore. It had to be cleansed. It had to be destroyed. So to say that, the Bible does not teach pacifism. It teaches peace, but not pacifism. But the Jehovah's Witnesses are pacifists. I mean, so they believe that all war, any violence, anything like that is totally unjustifiable. And therefore, they do nothing even to defend their own home from intruders. I'm not kidding. Now, if, praise God, that criminals in general, okay, I don't care how many 
movies you've seen or whatever where they try to make all these criminals who are super smart. In general, for the most part, criminals are incredibly stupid. Really. And if, I mean, if you don't believe what I'm saying, I mean, I remember when I was younger, many, many, many years ago, my dad used to watch that show Cops. There's a show called Cops in which they will just show what it's like on a shift when a cop's going through and he's, he's dealing with certain cases throughout the evening and all that. And if you don't understand, I mean, I'm not encouraging, encouraging people to watch any TV whatsoever, but if you don't understand how stupid criminals really are, one episode of Cops should do it for you. There is a lot of ignorance, especially of, of the law and basic understanding of criminal activity. I mean, it's just, it's, it's foolishness. And so I praise God that criminals are not smarter. Because if a thief, if somebody who, who was, you know, they made it their duty to break into people's homes and steal, a thief, right? Then if they were smart, all they need to do is look up all the addresses of where Jehovah's Witnesses live and break in and steal their stuff. After all, there's, there's going to be no threat. As long as they're fast, they don't have to worry about being shot or being injured whatsoever because, after all, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they're not supposed to even defend their homes because they're pacifists. I mean, you think, I'm not trying to give, you know, don't misunderstand, I'm not trying to give criminals a way into criminal activity because it's wickedness and sin, but I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, why don't they do something like that? But again, thank God that the criminals are stupid. So anyway, uh, I just want to get, but I, the point of saying this is getting the, cross, the point across to you of what a pacifist actually is and what the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching. So they also claim they have nothing to do with politics, and they state this on their official website, going back to jw.org. They have an article called, Why Do Jehovah's Witnesses Maintain Political Neutrality? It says, quote, We do not lobby, vote, for political parties or candidates, run for government, office, or participate in any action to change governments, end quote. Now, first of all, before we continue, some of you may have remembered I did a te teaching called Do Christians Vote, which you can find by going to creationliberty.com, typing the word vote, V-O-T-E, into the search bar, and you'll find that article. In that, I talked about how there are many, many Christians that are going out and voting for wicked men, and that we should not be voting for wicked men. I never taught that Christians shouldn't vote. I'm saying we should not be voting for wicked men. And since most of the people, and you know, I talked about even the biblical qualifications, what would be a biblical qualification for even putting your stamp of approval onto a vote? Most Christians, or at least people claiming to be Christians, I'll say most churchgoers don't even care. And so because what they what do they do? Come come around voting time, they're like, oh, it's America, American duty to vote. If you don't vote, then you it's as good as you are Adolf Hitler yourself, and you've killed millions of soldiers. That's that's the attitude they approach this with. All oh, these soldiers died so you could vote. That is not why they died. <laughs> Wait a second, hold on. That's not the case. I talk more about that in that teaching. I'm going to leave it for that. But the fact of the matter is, is that when you're putting your stamp of approval on evil. You're putting your stamp of approval on evil. You're going to have to give account for that before God. Because why would you be in agreement with evil? That's what your vote is. It's your agreement. Well, I don't agree with everything they teach. Then why are you voting for them? If you don't agree, well, you know, I like all their, their, all their uh, policies on this and this and this, and they're doing what's right here, but, you know, uh, they kind of support the gay agenda, but I'm just going to ignore that. Why are you putting your stamp of approval with somebody who does that. See, that's the problem. And so it's it's yoking together, which that's what it does. That's what the vote is doing. You're yoking together with those people. And so you need to be careful where you're putting your vote. But in general, I haven't voted in a long time because of that reason right there. And so I'm, I'm concerning myself more with teaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, Jehovah's Witnesses teach you don't vote at all. No political parties, nothing. You don't lobby, you don't know candidates, don't run for government office, no participation in any government action, any government to change to change governments, nothing. And the title to their article, I will repeat, says, quote, maintain political neutrality, end quote. Well, that's interesting because the Watchtower joined forces with the United Nations back in the 90s. Huh. Why? 
Well, according to this Guardian article, which is entitled, Jehovah's Witnesses Link to UN Qu Queried, Sect Accused of Hypocrisy Over Association with Organization It Has Demonized, it says, quote, the United Nations is being asked to investigate why it has granted associate status to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the fundamentalist U.S.-based Christian sect, which regards it as the scarlet beast predicted in the book of Revelation. And yes, they do. I'll get to that in a minute. The Watchtower Society has been denouncing the U.N. and its predecessor, the League of Nations, for 80 years, believing them to be a world empire of false religion predicted in the book of Revelation. A recent publication since the organization obtained its recognition describes the UN as a, quote-unquote, a disgusting thing in the sight of God and his people, end quote. The Jehovah's Witnesses officially became a non-governmental organization, that's called an NGO for short, a non-governmental organization that was approved by the UN back in 1992. And the UK news article I just quoted points out that the Watchtower has condemned the UN, not just before, because they did condemn them before they got NGO status, but also after they got NGO status. Why did they yoke up with an entity they believe is Satan's organization? And the reporter was not exaggerating the position of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Don't let anybody, any Jehovah's Witness tell you that. Because their official website, going back to JW.org, they have an article called, What is the Scarlet Colored Beast of Revelation Chapter 17? Now, of course, I originally got this information in 2017 when I finished doing all the research for this, but I went back to check the link that I put in there yesterday, just to make sure it's still there, and it's still there to this day. It says, quote, the scarlet colored beast described in Revelation chapter 17 is a symbol of the organization whose purpose is to unite and represent the nations of the world. It first existed as the League of Nations and is now the United Nations. End quote. It's, it's, folks, I'm not, I'm not misinterpreting anything here. I'm quoting you directly. Here's, here are the facts. They're an NGO. Here's what they say on their website. It totally contradicts. They believe that the UN is Satan's organization, that it, quote, dishonors God and is full of blasphemous names, end quote, and yet they have yoked up with them. The only way that the Watchtower would join Satan's organization is if its leadership was not of God. This is not an issue of misinterpretation or complex deduction here. The fact of the matter is that the Watchtower is full of liars and hypocrites. So please understand this going forward, is that whatever, I mean, the we talked about this in the Freemasonry thing. I realize there's a lot of people that love to go into this stuff. I, I've gone into it some, but I'm not going to continue in it because it doesn't matter what these people are doing in secret societies. But there are secret societies like the Illuminati that are, they have a place. They have people in positions in the leadership of every major religion around the world. Jehovah's Witnesses are no different. That's why they're a part of the, the League of Nations, or the United Nations. That's why they're a part of it, because these are all interconnected. And the followers, they don't care what the followers believe, so long as they keep giving them money. So anyway, let's get back to this timeline to finish this off, because we're still trying to figure out what is the origin of Jehovah's Witnesses here. We haven't actually got to that yet. Well, I'm building to that point. In 1918, Russell's book, the Un or, excuse me, The Finnish Mystery, a helping hand for Bible students was condemned by Attorney General Thomas W. Gregory as a conspiracy against the U.S. Army. This condemnation was a response to a petition to release restrictions on the book. Because as we'll see in a moment, I'm, I'm getting to that point, Rutherford has to make a deal with the U.S. government to restrict certain teachings in the book. And what Thomas Gregory, Attorney General at the time, said was the following, and this is from the Congressional Record from the U.S. Government Printing Office from May 4, 1918. It says, quote, The passage of this amendment would reopen our camps to this poisonous influence, end quote. See, our government still does state true things every now and again, folks. It still does function to some degree, I'm glad, because it is poisonous influence. But... After appealing their case in court, the Watchtower directors were released on bail. Because after all, I mean, even though 
I mean, first of all, they can say, well, he just kicked us out. We're not really a part of the organization anymore. At the same time, they still did promote it prior to that time. So they were still guilty at the time all this was being filed. But Rutherford remained because he's the head honcho, right? He's the CEO that now has sole control over everything. In order to be released from custody, Rutherford made a pact with the U.S. government that they would instruct their cult members to cut out pages 245 to 254 of the finished mystery, and that the Watchtower would stop printing copies of the book. So they both had to stop printing copies, and that every person out there who owned a copy of it in the Jehovah's... Well, they weren't Jehovah's Witnesses yet, but in the Bible students, the Russellite cult, all of them were instructed to cut out those pages, which... I don't know whether they did actually did or not. That That's unclear. But anyway, after clearing up all the offenses against the U.S. military, Rutherford started replacing, I mean, once he got out, he replaced elected elders from the Watchtower churches, because they used to operate somewhat like the Christian churches do, in which they would, they would have elders put in place to make certain de decisions and all that and oversee things. And so he started replacing these elders with hand-picked staff that Rutherford personally appointed to this position. He's hand-picking people that are on his side. And this transformed the Russellite cult into a strictly run corporate network in a very short amount of time. It's actually really impressive how fast he did this. However, some of the congregations among the Russellites resisted these changes. So what happens? Well, it causes a split. So you've got a bunch of new sects that are created. You have the Dawn Bible Students, which, by the way, still exist to this day. DawnBible.com, the Chicago Bible Students, ChicagoBible.org, the Layman's Home Missionaries, now called Bible Standard Missionaries at BibleStandard.com. They all still exist today. And most people don't understand this is the same wicked branch as the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they think they're different. Now, since their cult was generally known as the Bible students at that time, that's why you have the, the branches called the Dawn Bible students, Chicago Bible students. That's why they did all that, okay? But they were generally known as the Bible students. So to differentiate between Rutherford's majority sect and the splinter groups that went out, on October 1st, 1931, Rutherford changed the name of his organization to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's where it came from. So that's why I was following the story from where the doctrine really began with William Miller back in the early 1800s, and then by the early 1900s in 1931, that's where Jehovah's Witnesses came from. So during this time, Rutherford moved away from the emphasis that Charles Russell had, namely that members' personal improvement and understanding was kind of the goal that Russell was was promoting, even though he's a false prophet and he was giving them understanding of wickedness. So what Rutherford did instead was focus on pushing Jehovah's Witness literature. Now that ought to start making sense to you now for any of you who'd know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses. He declared that it was the duty of every Jehovah's Witness to go door to door and distribute Watchtower books and tracts and made it a requirement within the organization, then that requirement still exists today. Yes, they are required, and we're going to find out, we're going to get more details on this later. Jehovah's Witnesses know they are required, in order to get into heaven, they are required to go door to door and talk to people and distribute Watchtower books and tracts. That's one of the requirements for them to get into heaven, or at least into the second level of the new renewed earth. We'll get to that later. They have a lot of very strange beliefs. And I know this is going to upset. If there's any Jehovah's Witness that, like I said, by the miracle of God is listening to this, they might, they might get upset. But the truth is that the entire foundation of Jehovah's Witnesses is for these people to be door-to-door -door salesmen for the Watchtower Society. That's it. In the next few parts on this audio teaching, we're going to cover a lot of the strange doctrines and beliefs upheld by Jehovah's Witnesses. But 
basically in this part, I wanted us to first understand and acknowledge that Jehovah's Witness traditions and doctrines have been largely handed down from false prophets and heretics over the past 180 years. And I'm going to repeat the following one more time from Charles Russell in his Studies in the Scripture, Volume 2, page 242. Quote, We need to examine not only what we personally believe, but also what is taught by any religious organization with which we may be associated. Are its teachings in full harmony with God's word, or are they based on the tradition of men? If we are lovers of truth, then there is nothing to fear from such examination. End quote. So, let's begin examination. Let's compare the Bible's Jesus with the Jehovah's Witnesses' Jesus. Okay, because the, there are two separate things here. The Bible has the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Jehovah's Witnesses would have what I would call a lowercase, in quotations, Jesus. It is a different God, a false God that they serve, who they call Jesus. And the difference can be clearly seen by looking at the doctrines that they teach and then comparing them with the Bible, and that's what we're going to do here. So on the Watchtower and Jehovah's Witnesses' official website, through their official magazines, they have stated the following, quote, If Jesus of the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old Testament, as many claim. Now, we believe that God the Father and Jesus Christ are one. That the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament and Jesus Christ, all right, they're all one. So they're saying if the Jesus of the New Testament and is Jehovah of the Old Testament, as many claim, should there not at least be one biblical reference saying that Jesus is Jehovah? Yet, there is not one. End quote. That's right. The Watchtower and Jehovah's Witnesses state there is not one reference to Jesus and Jehovah being one, right? And what, what they call Jehovah, because what they call Jehovah is not even, that's not the Christian God of the Bible either. God the Father and Jesus Christ are one, and there are many verses that we can show to that effect as well, which we're going to go over. But what Jehovah's Witnesses are, are doing here is a very common thing I keep seeing in a lot of these New Age heretics. Uh, whether you go to anyone from Stephen Anderson to Matt Slick to any of these New Age people, okay, right, where they're doing all their cultic doctrines, right? I find that this is what they'll do. They'll say, oh, see, if you look up these two words, you won't find them in any verse. And what they're trying to do is get people to go to a keyword search in some, you know, take your pick, whatever Bible website has a keyword search. Look up two keywords and then they won't find them connected. That is not how you do a Bible study, folks. And the Watchtower is doing the same thing here. What they want people to do is to go into any Bible, type in Jesus, type in Jehovah, and they say, see, you won't find anything. You won't find these connected anywhere. And so they come to the conclusion that Jesus and God are not one. It's, it's a fallacious way of thinking, but I've watched many people do this. It's incredibly deceptive, and I guess it just it makes me angry when I see it. And I try to stay calm and reasonable just to explain to people the truth about this. I just want to warn my brethren not to fall prey to this stuff, okay? But we're going to cover these a lot of these different types of issues like this one by one as we go through these. But... First of all, the name Jesus does not appear in the Old Testament. Because remember what they said, well, Jehovah the Old Testament, Jesus the New Testament, you're not going to see any references between those. That's because, first of all, the name Jesus does not appear in the Old Testament. God did not reveal that name to anyone until he told it to Joseph and Mary. And that's in Matthew 121. It says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So in Matthew 123, it also says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us. So the Bible not only gives us the name, gives us the interpretation. The interpretation of the name is supposed to be God with us, which shows us this is God in the flesh coming to earth and being the ultimate sacrifice for the payment of sin. And there's many correlating verses to back this up. Don't think I'm just, that's going to be the complete argument. We're going to go over this for a while. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 16, it says, And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us. Okay, that great prophet they're talking about in Luke chapter 7, they're talking about Jesus Christ. 
a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. They're talking about Christ. They said God visited his people. So, I mean, this is the reaction that they had after they saw Jesus Christ raise a young man from the dead. They knew Christ was God in the flesh. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is Christ. It says, And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's Christ. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is called, Jesus is called the Everlasting Father in Isaiah chapter 9. There's only one way Jesus could be called the Everlasting Father, and that's if Jesus is God. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. says This is going to be total 12 through 16. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, for by him, this is talking about his dear son, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. All things were created by him and for him. So this verse tells us that the son, Jesus Christ, is the creator of all things. And we know from Genesis that God the Father is the creator of all things. Well, how do you reconcile that? Christ is God. Now, Jesus Christ got a lot more specific when he told us that he and his Father are one. He directly said that. John chapter 10, starting in verse 29, it says, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Well, how do you get more direct than that? Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, if they come to your door, they're going to reject all these verses, all this doctrine you're going to give them, okay? But there is an easy way to show them what they believe is unbiblical. And I have some of this on our Jehovah's Witness tract that I mentioned at, in the very first part, at the beginning of the first part of this teaching. And I'll probably mention it again later towards the end. But there, on the tract, I give some of this because you can show them what they believe is not true. Jehovah's Witnesses are very, very strict on the title of Alpha and Omega being God. They are extremely strict on the beginning and the end being their Jehovah God. The first and the last being Jehovah God. They are attributed to the Almighty God and no other. They are very strict on that. And you can ask them. They said, who, you ask them, who is the Alpha and Omega? They'll tell you. Who's the beginning and the end? Who's the first and the last? And it is true, the Alpha and Omega is God the Father. As the Bible points out in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. So for God to share this name with another would make him a liar. Because if he shared that name with another, then he's not the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so... As we read from Colossians chapter 1, Jesus Christ also identifies as the creator of this world, the beginning and the end. And this is going to create a problem for Jehovah's Witnesses later in the book of Revelation, okay? Because in Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must be done. Okay, so it said, the Lord God of the holy prophets. That is the Almighty God, the Alpha and Omega, right? By the way, Alpha and Omega means beginning and end anyway. Uh, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. And that's why, even though there are Greek words in the King James Bible, the Word of God, God preserved his word that he even defined those on top of that. So you don't have to know that stuff to, in order to read it and understand it. So anyway, but it continues and says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So who's coming quickly? The Lord God of the holy prophets. That is the Almighty God, the Alpha and Omega, what they call Jehovah God, right? He's the one that's coming quickly. 
God identified himself speaking here again, and he confirms it again by identifying himself as the Alpha and Omega in Revelation chapter 22. Going, if we skip forward to verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly. He says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So it is the Lord God, the Father, the everlasting Father that is coming quickly. Now, after identifying himself as the Almighty God, he then says in Revelation 22 and verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Verse 20, he which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. So this clearly points out that the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ are one, just as Christ said in John chapter 10 that they are one. Now Jehovah's Witnesses, they refuse to believe this, and they'll write objections to this biblical argument at jw.org, their official website. However, go check it out for yourself. They have an article on their website called Alpha and Omega. Okay, and I left the references on the website where you can go look this up. There isn't any substance to their writings, and I'm not saying that vaguely. I mean there is no substance in their writings. They just claim that Revelation doesn't say what I just showed you it says. Now, on what basis do they make that claim? Well, they say that one of their so-called, in quotations, scholars concluded that it may not have been Jesus that they were talking about there. That's it. Just because someone claims that it may not have been Jesus doesn't make it true, first of all. But second, the context of Scripture clearly spells out that the Almighty God and Jesus Christ both identify as Alpha and Omega. But Jehovah's Witnesses won't believe it because they don't want to believe it, because it flies in the face of everything that they teach. They, do, they teach, if I, I apologize if I didn't make this clear earlier, they teach that Jesus is not God. They teach that Jesus is created. However, don't be disheartened by that. If you show this to a Jehovah's Witness and they don't listen, there's one more thing you can really add in here. And this is one that they don't have, an, I haven't found an answer, even on their website, that talks about this one. They're going to insist that the authorship, when I remember when I told you that it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angels, they're going to say, well, the authorship of the text changes there. So now Jesus is talking. It's not, it's not God talking at that point. Okay, but you are confirming that the first and the last is Jehovah God, right? Yes, they will believe that. Okay, so now the Jehovah's Witnesses have confirmed that the first and the last is only talking about Jehovah God. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. Now, who's this talking? That is their, what they will say is Jehovah God. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Okay, so Jehovah's Witnesses, if I were just talking to them, I would ask them, when did Jehovah God die? Because he says, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. When did Jehovah God die? You could even take it one step further and ask, when did Jehovah God die and was resurrected from the dead? There is only one way to answer that in Scripture, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and God are one. And again, this is for the sake of any Jehovah's Witnesses. On the off chance that somebody might be listening to this, I'm going to, because here's what they'll do. They'll say, oh, well, that's just from your King James Bible. We don't like that. We want to use our New World Translation. Okay, let's go to Revelation chapter 1 from the 2013, which is the latest at the time I got this, New World Translation, and I'm going to do this just for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Quote, And he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, and the living one, and I became dead, but look, I am living forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of the grave." End quote. The Lord God 
does not allow anyone to do anything except by his allowance of his will. God would not allow them to change this, even in their corrupt New Age version, in, so that even Jehovah's Witnesses, if they were really looking for the truth, could read this word and see the problem between Jehovah's Witness teaching and what is actually written down in their documents. Now, it's very likely in future versions of the New World Translation, because, and I have to say future versions, guys, they I think it was in the 1950s when they first created the New World Translation. They departed from the King James Bible. But in the New World Translation, they have, I mean, because they call it the perfect translation, yet they have to correct it every few years. Why do they have to keep correcting the perfect translation? That doesn't make any sense. But I'm just telling you, because right now, it, when I'm giving this audio teaching, it's 2018. Likely, in the future, they're going to alter even the very text I'm talking to you about right now, if God lets them. Because nothing happens that is not by his will. But they're going to alter this text later, as they've done with many other they, they keep changing verses all the time. Oh, we found another problem verse here, and they change it. But you know what the problem with that is? The more they change, the more they don't realize they change in other verses. Because as we've learned in Isaiah chapter 28, it says that the word of God was to be read precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Which means it's an interlinking web of verses that interconnect together. If you change one, you change others. Or at least, you don't change others. If you change one, you would have to change others. But the problem is, is that mankind does not understand the full, really, I mean, ultra genius beyond our understanding, the the interconnective connectivity of the Word of God. It's just so interconnected, and it's it's beyond what mankind is capable of doing, the Word of God is. And so, they don't understand by changing one, you're now contradicting other verses. So with each one they change, they think, oh, wow, okay, we're saving. Finally, people are not going to qu be questioning this doctrine once we change that, but then it's going to contradict other verses. Some of what I'm exposing is going to be, might be even irrelevant later on, and then somebody else will have to come after me, and they'll have to see, see where they changed this, now they made this incorrect, and then they'll have to expose those. And, and so, so the it's never going to be ending, okay? But the point is, we expose some of this stuff for the sake of Jehovah's Witnesses, of those few that may hear the truth and come to repentance and be born again, and then come out from among that wicked yoke to take the light yoke, the, the, where his commandments are not grievous, to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith alone, by his grace alone, not of works. So anyway, there is, I mean, but they believe that Jesus is created, and there is no created being. There is no created being, neither man nor angel, that can pay the eternal debt of sin. Only God can save people from their sins. And I repeat this from Matthew 121, where thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save people from their sins. The only way Jesus could save people from their sins is to be God. Jesus Christ taught as one having authority, meaning the authority of that he is God. For he taught them as one having authority. That's Matthew chapter 7 and verse 29. In fact, you have to believe this if the rest of Scripture is going to make sense. You have to believe this because in John chapter 5, in verse 18, it says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Why were they trying to kill him? Because, you know, Maybe his, his beard wasn't trimmed right and they didn't like how he looked? No. It continues to say, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father. Now, they don't stone people to death for breaking the Sabbath. But said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Okay, so now what are, the, what are they going to say here? What are Jehovah's Witnesses? What will they tell you? They'll say, oh, no, no, he was just claiming that he was a son of God. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Let me go to John chapter 10 again, okay? John chapter 10, verse 30. It says, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. 
He wasn't saying he was a son of God. He said, I and my father are one. Now we in the church of Christ would never make such a statement. We are not one with God. We are his children, but we are not one with him. Jesus was one with God and is one with God, I will say. Sorry, I was, I was saying was in terms of the tense that I'm reading this of the historical note. But he is actively the son of, the son of God. He is. He and God are one. Uh, so then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. That's why they were doing it. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? I mean, after all, if it's the truth, why are they stoning to kill him? That's what he's asking them. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not. They don't have a reason. He says, But for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. But you see, he proved what he was saying. He didn't just say it, he also provided the evidence of it. But this is important because what Jehovah's Witnesses is going to tell you is that Jesus is, they, they might use the phrase, oh yeah, Jesus is the Son of God, but really they don't mean the same thing the Bible tells us, okay? And a lot of times they'll try to avoid saying the Son of God. Like, for example, from JW.org in an article they have called, Why is Jesus Called God's Son? It says, quote, The Bible teaches, uh, teaches that Jesus was created by God, so Jesus is also called a Son of God, end quote. Now notice, they said that Jesus is called a Son of God, but not the Son of God. So, for example, if I were to say, you know, let's say you're in my house, and I told you, I said, hey, go get me a spoon. You would go into the silverware drawer or whatever, pull out a spoon, and bring me a spoon. Now, if I said, go get me the spoon, you would say, which one? Because the is a definite article, okay? The Son of God versus a Son of God. See, we men and women in the church, we are called the sons and the daughters of God, but the Son of God is indicating that it is Jesus Christ, okay? But what the Jehovah's Witnesses are doing are making continual effort to lower the divinity of Christ. There's no place in the Bible that teaches that Jesus was created by God. That is a pagan concept that is made up by the Jehovah's Witness cult. And again, as we read earlier in Colossians chapter 1, the Bible specifically points out that Jesus Christ is the Creator. However, because Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Christ was created, therefore they believe that Son of God, the term Son of God, simply means a created being that is not God. But that's not how it's defined in Scripture. So the verses I just quoted, again, the Jews recognized that the phrase Son of God, in the context he meant that, and the name Emmanuel, God with us, are the same thing. In other words, they knew that Christ's claim to be the Son of God meant that he claimed to be God himself, who had come in the flesh. The term Son of God can have multiple meanings, but in this context, the Jews themselves defined it as Christ's claim to be God. And so most hated him and they wouldn't follow him because of that reason. If you don't have that in Scripture, how, does, how do these passages even make sense? And, and here's the thing. They said, well, you know, he may not have called himself that and they got angry, but he's really a creative being or an angel or whatever, which we're going to get into later, that they claim that that is the case, right? But the problem is, if he claimed to be that which he was not, then Jesus was a liar and you can't trust anything he says, and therefore you can't trust that anybody's saved either, because the Bible says God cannot lie. So here we, there's a contradiction no matter what. You can't get around this. And what are Jehovah's Witnesses going to do when you bring this to them and you said, How, when did Jehovah God die? When you show them those verses, I'll tell you what they'll do. This is how they'll respond. They'll change the subject. I almost guarantee it. They will change the subject. Now, how do I know that? Because, as we'll get to later, Jehovah's Witness training sessions, because when they, remember, they are required by the Watchtower to go door to door. They have training seminars before they go out and do this stuff. In their training seminars, they teach them to change the subject 
if you don't have an answer. Don't get into a discussion with them. Don't investigate it. Don't do anything like that. Change the subject, and if you have any questions about it later, bring it to an elder. And then the elder will give you some, basically all he's going to do is give them an excuse to help them justify it in their minds to ignore it, but they're not going to give them the facts. But they're taught to change the subject. This is exactly how they will do it. So be prepared for this. And for a Jehovah's Witness, I won't let them change the subject on me. If I'm going to show them the scripture on this point, they're going to stay on topic. And if they say, well, listen, I'm not going to give you an answer because I don't have an answer for that. I said, okay, well then take, you know, if I have my tract out, I'll say, take this with you, show it to your elders, have them give you an answer, and then come back to me. And that is what I really want them to do. Now, most Jehovah's Witnesses will not do that. Because if you took any materials from an apostate, you can be disfellowshipped. So they won't do it. But that's what I want them to do. If they're willing to go do that, that will be the beginning of the journey for them to find out the truth about Jehovah's Witnesses and how they really operate in their cult. So I really want them to do that. And we'll talk more about what will happen to them later in, in later parts of this teaching. So we just have to listen. Keep listening. Don't just listen to the first or second part. Listen through the whole thing because we got a lot more interesting information coming out that you may want to know. And again, the whole purpose I'm giving you guys all this information is that if you run into a Jehovah's Witness, that you can give them the truth of the Word of God, that their souls might be saved. That is the whole purpose of this. If the souls of, of Jehovah's Witnesses, people that are deceived by their cult, cannot be saved, then there is no purpose in me doing any of this teaching. Okay? So that's what I'm, I'm trying to prepare everybody for that. And if any Jehovah's Witness may be listening, that you have somewhere to turn. You are not alone if you come out of there. Contact our ministry, okay? And if if there's anybody we have that's close by that can help you, we'll have somebody that's close by that can help you, right? So uh, we'll, we'll just, we'll try to do that best we can. We don't have lots of resources because, again, most people, including churchgoers, hate what we teach. But, you know, if we can help you, we'll try to help you because a lot of those people that come out of Jehovah's Witnesses, they are alone and they have nowhere to turn. So anyway, continuing, they're saying that he... Now, sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, Christ is a God. I've heard them teach this before, too. He's a God, but he's not the God. That's what they're going to try to say. They'll say he's a created God who's not really eternal. And that's too contradictory to Scripture, because the Bible tells us that Christ is to be worshipped. In Hebrews 1, 6, it says, And again, when he bringeth... In the first begotten of the, into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Okay, so what he's saying is, is, let all the angels of God worship Jesus Christ. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses would respond to this by saying that Christ and God are worshipped separately or in different ways. But the Almighty God said in Exodus 34, 14, For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Okay, so that clearly spells out there is no other God to be worshipped. If you want to call Jesus another God, then for you to worship him goes against the word of God. I mean, it, if Christ is another created God, then God was in error not to rebuke the people for worshipping Christ. He should have done that. And Christ should have rebuked them for worshipping him. But in Matthew chapter 2, and verse 11, it says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. In Matthew chapter 8, and verse 2, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him. Why weren't these people rebuked? Matthew 9, 18, There came in a ruler and worshipped him. Matthew 14, 33, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Matthew 15, 25, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Matthew 28, 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Not once anywhere in the Bible are these people rebuked for worshipping Christ. And that's because they did not violate scripture by worshipping Christ, because by worshipping Christ they were worshipping God. Because I and my Father are one, he said. The reason they don't violate Exodus 34, 14 by worshiping Christ is because Jesus is God. 
Luke 4, 8 says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Well, then why are Jehovah's Witnesses, if that is true, why are Jehovah's Witnesses serving the Lord Jesus Christ? They have no business serving the Lord Jesus Christ if he is not God. They should only serve God, and, God, and Christ is God. The Lord Jesus Christ has to be God, otherwise there's a contradiction everywhere you turn in Scripture. And again, why did Christ not rebuke any of these people for worshiping him? It's only through Jehovah's Witness teaching that there's a contradiction in this. And through that contradiction, they seek to make God a liar, which the Bible says is not possible. Titus 1.2 says, In hope of life, eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, he cannot lie. And those of you who've been born again in repentance and faith, God cannot lie. He promised you life eternal. He can't lie. Trust in him. But do not put your faith in false cults like the Watchtower. Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. They're saying that Jesus is this creature that was created. And they seek to change the truth of God into a lie. God the Father said he would not give his glory of that worship to anyone else. Isaiah 42.8, for I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. God will only give his glory to himself. But listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 17 when he was praying to the Father. In verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Christ is the creator. God is the creator because Christ and God are one. God has glory and Jesus has glory the same glory because Jesus and God are one. There is no way to get around this. Now, of course, there are Jehovah's Witnesses that are going to come back and said, wait, 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 hold on a second. The scripture says that Jesus said that God was greater than he, that the Father was greater than he. And they go back to John chapter 14, verse 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye, have, if ye loved me... Ye would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses claim that God and Christ cannot be equal if one is greater than the other. But that's based on the presupposition that Jesus is not God. They have to presuppose that first. You see, Christ brought himself down to earth to live in the flesh. And while he is in the flesh, he is lesser than God. He did not know sin, but he was made sin for the purpose of sacrifice for our sakes. And that's talked about in 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So while he was in the flesh, God was greater than he. But when he died and rose from the dead, he was equal to the Father again. And I guess I'll, I'll end with this last point because I want to I want to kind of wrap this up here. My voice is starting to go, actually. But the Bible tells us that Christ raised himself from the dead. Now, wait a second. Only God can raise people from the dead. How did Christ raise himself from the dead? Because he is God. John chapter 2 and verse 19. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. He said, Destroy this temple, he's talking about my body, and in three days I will raise it up. They said, Oh, wait a second, that must be coming from your King James Bible. That can't be our, our perfect New World translation. Let me go to your so-called perfect New World translation. It says... And I got this directly from JW.org, from the New World Translation, on their website. Quote, Jesus replied to them, Tear down this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple was built in 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was talking about the temple of his body. End quote. 
Jehovah's Witnesses don't have an excuse. There is still enough gospel left even in the corrupt New World Translation that they could get saved. There's still enough. They don't have an excuse. They have access to the information, but they choose. And we're going to see that later. There are people that choose Jehovah's Witnesses for a very particular reason. Because they want to try to earn their way into heaven. There's a lot of reasons that they choose to, to join their Jehovah's Witnesses, but, and we'll get into more details on that later. But they don't have an excuse. Jesus raised himself from the dead, and the only way he can do that is if he is God. So next week we're going to continue on to talk about some of the changes Joseph Rutherford made and, and how that they actually believe that Jesus is Mark, Michael the Archangel. And we're going to tear that, that whole stronghold down in which they have tried into the imaginations of their minds create this stronghold like they have some sort of solid doctrine when they don't. Okay, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into other things about, they're going to say, well, he was on a torture stake. He wasn't on a cross, the difference in those certain doctrines that they teach. And then we're going to go on to talk about how the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that they have to work for their salvation. We're going to cover all those topics continuing next week. Did anybody have any questions or comments about anything we talked about today before we close? Well, thanks for joining us, everybody, this week, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless and protect you all as you seek to study his word and glorify him in all that you say and do, and God willing, we will see you next week.